Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, <clears throat> abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. <clears throat> oh, I'm switched around. Uh, again, I apologize for the ongoing sound weirdness. I did a bunch of investigation, and um, there really isn't a lot of answers for it, so I guess I have to try and fix it in the post, in the editing section of the, what I do with these videos, which I don't really want to do, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, I found one fix, but <clears throat> um, Apple's make it, a actually Apple made it harder to do this fix. I don't, I'm still trying to see if I can do it, but I'm on the case. <clears throat> uh, there are just an incredible amount of articles and things to cover. I, I'm not going to be able to cover them all. All the things that I want to talk about in this video, I'm going to do my best uh, to get in what I can get in. And um, right now, I'm just realizing that I'm forgetting something. But, you know, I forgot to line up something in my queue. Uh, anyways, we'll just make do. I want to start uh, this with a comment from Jane. And Jane is a frequent commenter, and I really enjoy the things that Jane has to say on this channel. <clears throat> um, if I could read her comments more, I would. Um, she says, at John Doe, to me, reactive gen geoengineering is possibly the saddest hubris. The cries of giant egos having no respect towards nor understanding of this complex world. The geoengineer doesn't comp comprehend how myriads of living creatures and physical systems are interconnected. Yet, the geoengineer will spray material into the sky without any care on who or what it affects or rains down on. The geoengineer is the proverbial stomping bull in a precious, delicate china shop. Um, excellent comment from Jane, and that is so very true. We don't know what kind of... Oh, we know what we have unleashed through our uh, current activities and we tried to do more activities in the face of our current activities, um, probably unleashing even more hell <clears throat> upon this earth. Um, it is a narrow, narrow path down this mountain. Um, but probably one of the best things we can do is stop doing the activities that we're doing rather than add more activities while whilst still doing these activities. So uh, um, everybody's been talking about this, and uh, Paul Beckwith already has a video on this. Nitrous oxide emissions from thawing permafrost might be higher, as in, yep, they're higher. A recent paper shows that nitrous oxide emissions from thawing Alaskan permafrost might be about 12 times higher than previously assumed 12 times. Um, so this is just scientific reticence. When they say might, they mean um, as in higher, absolutely they're higher. How, high, how much higher? One can only guess. Nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent, mo more potent than carbon dioxide. 300 more times. So this might mean, mean that the Arctic and global climate are in more danger than we thought. The study only uh, the study only co collected data on emissions during August. The data represents 310 of the 14.5 million square kilometers in the Arctic, like using a Rhode Island-sized plot to represent the entire United States. So there you go. Um, There's a link to the entire study. I'm just, this is an overview. I'm going to link it below. You guys can check that out. Here's another overview. Uh, aerosol, this is from uh, vivacondleaf.com or vivacondleaf. I don't, I have no idea. 
Uh, this is titled Aerosol Masking Effect Policy Action Deadlock Resolution. Perhaps the darkest chapter of our global warming. This is from April 15th, 2019. Perhaps the darkest chapter of our global warming emergency is the policymaker deadlock with the fact that aerosols and particular particulate matter are having a cooling effect that we will lose as we halt combustion, causing a rebound of warming and taking us into 2C warming category. The way to address this is to remove all reactive GHGs and short-lived climate pollutants with technology that emits hydroxyl radicals as we stand down from combustion. The way to address this is to remove all reactive GHGs and short-lived climate pollutants with technology that emits hydro hydroxyl radicals as we stand from down from combustion. Sorry, I read that terribly. This hydroxyl response would remove 2C of heat if it were large enough as we if it were large enough as we shift off fossil fuels. Policymakers appear to be paralyzed by this problem of aerosol masking because emissions increased in 2018. We can't continue this in action and need complementary complementary work such as hydroxyl dispersal to be started and scaled before we reach a global tipping point as the Arctic is in abrupt warming amplification. Just a little note, writer of this article, we are, <laughs> um, we have already reached a global tipping point. The, the global tipping point has been breached. Um, so stop all that. The, bu bu the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have called for just such a measure as hydroxyl dispersal. So here's a, a link to this. Um, I'm going to link it below, but I'm going to look at this real quickly. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Even, have glo even as global emissions are going up again after three years of no growth, and coal, the worst climate polluter, remains stubbornly near its historic level globally at 27% of the world's energy mix, uh, with projections that will decline only slightly to 25% by 2023. Um, how much harder will it be the, for the United States to pursue a low emissions climate policy when it must wrestle with the growing geopolitical power related to such oil dominance? Um You know, I don't have time to read this this article, this particular article. I'm going to link uh, all of this below. But maybe I'll come back and read this tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Uh, because it wasn't, I didn't, ha I didn't design my time to be able to read this. Uh, moving on to another... <clears throat> Abstract, potential effects of large-scale projects designed to offset Earth's changing climates. This is from April 16th, 2019, uh, from Science Daily and from the Concordia University. Of all the different possible methods to combat an anthropogenic climate change conceived of, of so far among the least studied as climate engineering, an umbrella term for large-scale projects designed, designed to disrupt the Earth's carbon cycle or radiation balance, climate engineering has only relatively recently been included in the conversation about methods that could mitigate the harm caused by carbon emissions. Research into various climate engineering projects has grown, but according to Nadine Mengus, who until March 2019 was a Horizon postdoctoral fellow at Concordia's Matthews Climate Lab, too few of the studies produced to date have looked at the large-scale side effects that these projects would have on interconnected variables. Right, of course, they did not look at the large-scale side effects. This is how humans and, uh, you know, real smart people operate. Um, well, if we do this, then this will happen. Great, let's do it. They don't, <laughs> but then that's where they stop. But it also, also this and this and this and this will happen. Well, let's just go with the first one. Um, in a new paper published by the in the uh, journal Climatic Change, Mengus examines examines possible disruptions on relationships between a large number of what she calls Earth system variables. The aspects of the climate that are not the direct target of the engineering projects will nonetheless be affected by them, caused by three different climate engineering methods. The big three, Mengus, who changed 
her affiliation to Simon Fraser University this winter, but completed her research for this paper while at Concordia. Looked at three proposed climate engineering methods for her study. Here is how each one works in a very broad term. First, solar radiation management. This involves actually adding aerosols into the stratosphere that would scatter incoming radiation from the sun and block some of the energy that would otherwise enter the Earth's system. Think of, think of it as m- mimicking the effects of a volcanic explosion. Does this sound like a good idea? I don't think so. In an unperturbed or unmanaged climate, we would have an increasing temperature as a result of increasing CO2 concentrations, she said. But if we manipulate the radiation balance of the planet, temperatures would level or go down while CO2 levels remain unmitigated. The second is is ocean alkalinity enhancement. Uh, This involves grinding massive amounts of rocks and dumping them into the surface ocean where they would absorb carbon dioxide via a chemical reaction. This would lead to an increase in ocean alkalinity, the ability to neutralize acid, and subsequently raise oceanic pH levels, indicating lower levels of acidity. However, to be effective, Menga says millions of tons of rock would have to be ground down and dumped into the ocean. Based on today's standards, it's not only impractical, ocean dumping is also illegal. The third is large-scale afforestation. As the name implies, it is the exact opposite of deforestation, but does not end with the planting of millions upon millions of trees. Because trees only absorb large amounts of carbon when they are growing, says Mangus, these trees would have to be planted and then harvested, and the carbon in them sequestered. A cycle would have to be repeated constantly in order to be effective and would require, by some estimates, reforesting an area the size of Europe. She is, of course, aware that none of these measures... Is possible to implement in the immediate future, but notes that these estimates are based on current emission rates. If humans reduce emissions dramatically, some form of these measures could be implemented at smaller scales. Problems and solutions are global. Menga stressed that the research on climate engineering methods remain far too narrow and therefore of limited value to take well-informed decisions. I think we're skipping ahead several steps, she said. There are issues we need to look at before getting to specifics, like how climate engineering can help crop yields. She hopes the scientific community will use her paper as an orientation to investigate the side effects these projects can cause in a more comprehensive, holistic way. As for the public, she hopes they will come to understand that the field is still comparatively young. There are still a lot of unknown unknowns, she said. Things we don't even know about yet might be impacted, and I hope my paper sheds some light on that. So I'm going to link this below um, with a link to the paper y'all can check out and i'm going to attempt to read this entire article hopefully it won't take me too long this is from medium and this is titled 12 years by gary l francione uh dated april 20th we are facing an, an imminent climate catastrophe the united nations says that we've got about 12 years left to avert that catastrophe 12 years That is not a lot of time. Remember when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone? That seems like yesterday. It occurred in 2007, 12 years ago. Remember when J.K. Rowling announced the last Harry Potter novel? That seems like yesterday. It was in 2007, 12 years ago. So what should we do given that we have 12 years and that 12 years is not a lot of time? We could turn to technology and hope that we can find and implement some sort of fix. That sounds terrific, but what is the likelihood that a real solution can be found and implemented in 12 years? That is a rhetorical question. The chances are very slim. We could turn to government and ask, if, ask it to find a solution. That, too, sounds terrific, but can we think of mainly instance, uh, many instances where government has been responsive to public concerns and has done something that does not directly benefit large corporations who constitute the true government? Bam. That, too, is a rhetorical question. The answers are very slim. And I'll add, to none. There's a a picture of an Extinction Rebellion rebel gluing his hands to public transport. So I guess they glued his hands to a train. Stopping the train. As I watch the Extinction Rebellion folks glue themselves to various objects and demand that the government create and cede authority to, to a citizen's assembly that will decide how to avert climate catastrophe, I wonder, seriously... If these people live on the same planet as I do, does anyone really believe that there is a snowball's chance in hell of that happening? Is there anyone that, anything that we could do that would make a difference? Yes, there is one thing that we could do that does not require technological innovation or governmental action. 
the one thing, the one thing we can transition to a vegan diet. Oh Lord, are you serious? <laughs> okay, let's not protest or anything, or but let's all just go vegan. I mean, you know, helpful on some reasons uh, on some levels, but come on, man. We have known for years now that agri animal agriculture is horribly unsound. Uh, you know, what are the chances that everybody's going to transfer to a vegan diet? The answer? Very slim. We know for years that animal agriculture is horribly unsound in terms of inefficient resource use. Animals have to consume many pounds of grain or forage to produce one pound of meat. Animal agriculture involves an inefficient use of water. It makes many times more water to produce a pound of meat than to produce a pound of potatoes or wheat. Uh, you, I, you know, <laughs> wow, I didn't, I didn't even expect this article to go in this direction. Um, the one thing, vegan diets. How about the one thing? Uh, stop having so many children. How about the one thing? Et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. Uh... Recent and very impressive work by Oxford researchers has made clear that a vegan diet is the single most significant thing we, do, we can do to avert climate catastrophe. One of those involved in that work. And I'm a proponent of vegan diets, so please go vegan, plant-based, all day. Um, but we're going to have to do much more than that. One of those involved in that work, Dr. Joseph Poor, stated a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the planet, Earth, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land, water, land use, and water use. He added that going vegan is far bigger than cutting down on your flights or buying an electric car. Is it? Is it? Is it? Not so sure. Man. Another Oxford research. I, I almost don't really want to read the rest of this. Another Oxford research team found that massive reductions of meat consumption was necessary to avert climate catastrophe. We're not talking about meatless Monday or vegan before six. We're talking about everyone eating 75% less beef, 90% less pork, and half the number of eggs. And dairy also has significant adverse environmental impacts. Anyways, let's skip down to the, the bottom here. Um, We're not going to avert climate catastrophe by going vegan. I'm sorry, Gary Francione. That's just foolish. Super foolish. I mean, you know, tr go vegan. <laughs> but that's not going to be the answer. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm not going to read the rest of this, but I'll link it below if you guys want to read this. You're totally welcome to. Uh, I hate when I do that. I, sometimes I don't even like, you know, skim through the article to see what it's about. I start reading and I'm like, mm, because it just runs into a brick wall really fast. Uh, you know, the problem is much, much bigger than just ve veganism or meat production. I mean, there's, you know, we, we do lots of damage with deforestation and uh, agriculture, you know, where we grow plants, soy, um, Palm oil, uh, all kinds of other things that aren't meat. Uh, we, we do damage with those things too. Industrial agriculture on, on a mass scale is damaging. Growing corn is super damaging. Um, do I prefer that we grow vegetables? Sure, totally. But uh, that's not the one thing that's going to save the planet. I'm sorry. Just completely um, unadulterated silliness. Um <laughs> Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. I uh, hope you all enjoyed this version of Black Bear News. I'm hoping I can figure out really, really quickly how to make this into a stereo recording on the, um, on the editing side. We'll see how it goes. You guys are, will either hear it or you won't. Um, if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, still going strong. Tomorrow, big day of action. Uh, April 22nd, lots going on. There's supposed to be some action in Los Angeles. So um, sign up for Extinction Rebellion Los Angeles on Facebook uh, and also sign up for the newsletters and uh, Extinction Rebellion newsletters going out daily. Um, check that out as well. Um, until next time, peace.